academy has been invaded by a new way of a new form of study. It used to be the case that um, at, at universities you uh, were teaching a recognised subject with a recognised curriculum and you were carrying out research or scholarship in the humanities uh, which was open-minded, um, guided by the pursuit of truth and, and um, not dismayed, particularly if it came to surprising or unorthodox conclusions. Now, uh, um, one of the first things that, uh, that happens when a, a totalitarian government takes over is that the universities are cleaned up. As I say, people who are doing that kind of thing uh, get thrown out. This is what happened when the Nazis took over the German universities and when the Soviets took over, the, the communists took over the, the Russian universities. Uh, and it was the case in Eastern Europe in my day, with the sole exception of Poland, which had universities which were the only universities uh, where every uh, professor was on the right. Uh, that was because the communists were everywhere. I wrote up these notes about two weeks ago. It's about four pages of detailed notes on a video about uh, John Caputo, who is a, a scholar of Christianity. And I made the notes because uh, Caputo is trying to turn a Christianity, Christianity to, uh, into a postmodern religion. Now, I think this is really important, and it, it was, uh, I was pretty well pleased to see Paul Vanderclay had some of the same objections and certainly took the the idea that someone would turn the whole religion into a new postmodern entity seriously. So Paul Vanderclay is he is preparing a larger argument. The larger argument is going to be this. Well, Christianity deserves a place in academic academia. Religion re re deserves a place in academia. You should study it, you should respect it, so on and so forth. So, uh, Paul Vanderclay, he's talking in this little clip here, he's talking about how uh, Jordan Peterson kind of engaged with religion. Uh, the need, people have this empty, this meaning crisis, and Jordan kind of worked within the academic uh, parts to deal with the meaning crisis but he knew, never actually took anyone to religion okay here goes conversation on twitter you've got Peugeot and you've got Peterson and then you've got Brett and you've got Sam and that's about where they line up and of course rationality rules is Jesus smuggling video which I thought was a tremendous video because I thought everything he said or almost everything he said in that video was really right that, that Jordan Peterson doesn't really smuggle Jesus. He doesn't really cross the line. He just makes that stairway to heaven and says, well, that's about as much as I can say in my Darwinian frame publicly, speaking as a psychologist, and shuts up there and everybody else just follows the stairs right up on over the line. Jordan Peterson comes along and goes just up to the line and won't rule out that there's a land beyond. And as Mouthy Buddha said, well... I just saw on the Uber Boyos channel, look at this. They're playing my game. They're doing interviews with some guy who went to London from Hungary, had a good high status job, you know, was an atheist, started listening to Jordan Peterson, flopped all the way over into the church. So in the future, uh, Pastor Paul Vanderclay, he's going to make the argument that there is a, a monomyth, a giant narrative that every culture uses to orient themselves in what they do. And certainly when they do something, use the monomyth to give yourself a sense of purpose and meaning in that monomyth. And this monomyth should be studied, just like, and certainly the Christian monomyth should be given a place there. When we uh, look for philosophical meaning in our lives, we're shopping for a monomyth that makes sense of the world, that gives us place in the world, and this will help us to become better people. And uh, it's a lens to see the our society through and make judgments, right? Pastor Paul Vanderclay would conclude this argument about the importance of a monomyth by saying that Christianity is the best monomyth and we need pastors to make sense of the monomyth and help people apply the monomyth to their own lives. The problem with the previous argument, the problem with saying 
that uh, Christianity is just a, a narrative that you can use to orient your life is that you really start importing all of the postmodern thought into what you say Christianity is. Pretty much you're you're making an argument for Christianity with the postmodern conceptions of narrative, the postmodern conceptions of truth, of meaning, and so on. Rather it's kind of a post truth argument. And here's a little clip with Stephen Hicks about just to just to organize your mind of how postmodernism is usually against truth. Or it it's a truth doesn't enter into postmodernism. It doesn't when you have a postmodern uh, work of art, it doesn't reflect truth, it doesn't interact with truth. Okay? Fundamentally what um, most Gen Z and Plutros have been looking at. It very much happened in the late 80s through the 90s where you have this clear, we were calling it applied postmodernism, but it's this clear, um, we're not optimizing for truth, we're optimizing for change. We're mm -hmm. optimizing, they're optimizing for something else. And so it was open for the hoax project the dog park paper uh, for yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like it's so oh. ridiculous how would anyone end up there <laughs> the author fairly <laughs> tags a number of one every hour <laughs> sexual encounters <laughs> between dogs as rape without providing a strong basis for the researcher's knowledge of whether these encounters were wanted or unwanted the author def <laughs> defines consensual dog sex as when the penetration was not resisted <laughs> But what are the author's credentials for, us, for assessing dog behavior to this extent? <laughs> that's, that's what this paper was about. Yeah. Is train men like we train dogs. It is also not politically feasible to leash men, yank their leashes when they misbehave, <laughs> or strike men with leashes or other objects in an attempt to help them desist from sexual aggression and other predatory behaviors. <laughs> It's not politically feasible. It's not politically feasible. <laughs> that would make sense, right? Yeah, the debasement is, uh, is, as you put it, predictive in the general principle. Because, yeah, yeah, the idea that the seeking for truth as a regulative ideal in your thinking, that, that high aspiration, uh, means that when you are a younger person and you are training, uh, you're going to set your standards very high and you're going to train your critical faculties in a certain direction. And you're going to uh, learn how to spot contradictions and be careful about evidence and probabilistic claims and different ways of framing partial evidence and so on. But once the truth as a regulative ideal goes out the window, then all of those logical, definitional, careful attention to, uh, to, to observation and so on, those go out the window. But on the normative side, and there's a, there's a strong connection there as well, you know, once you start, uh, you make a commitment to, you know, individuals aren't autonomous agents, right, with any locus of self-control and self-responsibility, you make the shift and you see people as avatars for various sorts of group identities or there are just these sh shifting col collectors in collision with each other. Mm -hmm. Once you go down that road, then there's going to then be another kind of debasement. You're not going to treat other individuals right with respect, mm -hmm. uh, or 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 be willing to tolerate argumentation and differences of opinion and challenges to your own viewpoint, or the idea that through discussion. Uh, we can sort out what's the best compromise or the best principle together. Again, all of those civil ethical skills will be suffering debate mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so both on the cognitive side and the normative side, we, uh, we go down the road. This is, we're in a very... So what you get when you acknowledge the postmodernist ideas, you're really uh, setting yourself up to play in their playing field. You're not using truth, so you're discarding truth just to enter the postmodernist space of ideas, just to enter that academic space which elevates postmodernism, right? I'm looking at the Notre Dame fire. 
Now, should you allow a postmodern professor to tell you what this fire means? Should they have control of the meaning in your life? Or is, uh, does truth not exist? Should other people just be able to say, oh, well, this is what it means. This is how we, we should respond. This is how we handle these things. This is what your emotional reaction to these things means. This is what you're allowed to say about these things. Should we really cede that to the academics? Really? I'm going to give a little example on what happens if you toss out truth by accident or it just gets tossed out. I think you kind of fall into the trap of you tend to use whatever uh, meaning or whatever whatever justification comes to mind and that's um, my overall point I don't think I'm gonna actually finish my point is that academics have a re are repulsed by Christianity because it does offer righteousness and this righteousness is what they oppose and I'm going to illustrate this with something that's pure from Pastor Paul Vanderclay and he's going to go into uh, how evolutionary or how the evolutionists deliberately hardened ev evolutionary science into something that would resist every little bit of meaning that would come from religion all right he's trying to work on the process of belief formation now now the jesus smuggling again you know as i understand it here the jesus smuggling is basically cheating and and it's dishonest and absolutely call people on that stuff but that's different from the biases of excluding them outright and again for me this shows an aspect of the IDW which I think is right sort of in the tension here where the spirit of geometry has taken over it's Ian McGilchrist's complaint about left brain thinking in our culture and the spirit of finesse needing to open it up and in order to actually address the decadence and find new growth at the door that um the idea was let's just pretend that we actually know what the mechanisms of selection are and so as a result we hardened evolutionary theory into a bulwark against jesus smugglers and that bulwark is in fact retarding scientific progress and that's what happened to the university the university that was that was born out of the church then let's keep let's keep grandma away from the kids rest within the field but no but of course religious people started their own universities and religious scientists are working the tensions as they go nobody can even have that thought because it's seen as a great achievement to make sure that no no jesus smugglers have gotten through the bulwark right there are no gaps for God. There are no gaps right. for your God, sir. All right. Got to keep the woo out, and well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to risk the woo. You're gonna have to go off into that chaotic territory, to. Okay, here goes. This is from the Wikipedia page. Now, once you got the woo out, they kind of put the woo back in because they had their own meanings ready at right at hand they 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 knew exactly what meanings that they wanted to push let's look at wikipedia uh, where is it here william graham summer sought to apply the lessons of biological evolution to social and political life just as, as in nature they claimed, progress occurs through a ruthless process of competitive struggle and survival of the fittest. So that human progress will only occur if government allows unrestricted business competition and makes no effort to protect the weak or unfit by means of social welfare laws. So you look at evolutionary science and right out the door it's already being applied to politics 
and I apologize if I sound like a little tyrant here, but they they always wanted they always wanted to attack meaning and justice and righteousness and that's how it always was and putting Christianity in this little narrative frame so that it becomes palatable to these people who, who want to uh, character, characterize their lives as a survival of the fittest and that's what's good and, and s we, we should not consider any we should not afford any quarter to the weak or unfit or people who do not believe in the right way or people who don't have postmodernism we cannot really give in to these people and certainly don't give up truth please alright thanks for listening guys